Okay, so today we are talking about empirical formulas, and this is going to be filling in your page seven. And so we're going to go through the steps together, two examples, and then you're going to be doing that last one all on your own. So, um, first, what is an empirical formula? It says the word simplest there, but I want you to add that it is the most reduced formula. And you might think this is weird because most of our formulas are reduced. Well, for our ionic compounds, they were all reduced. They had to be, but our covalent compounds weren't. We have things like glucose. You might recognize the formula, C6H12O6. This is what we call a molecular formula because that's the way the real molecule looks. But like you can tell when you're looking at these numbers, that is definitely not an empirical formula for glucose because it is not reduced. Now, if I gave you a formula like that, Given the formula, and I asked you to turn it into an empirical formula, all you got to do is use your reducing skills, just like what we did in ionic compounds. Divide everything by the lowest, uh, the greatest common denominator, sorry, which would be 6. That turns into CH2O. So finding empirical formulas is really easy if you already have a formula. You just reduce it. But the steps we're going to be going through today are what if I don't have a formula. What if I have some different information? And this is actually kind of the reverse of that percent composition stuff that we just did, because uh, this is taking some information about how much of each substance we have, either grams or the percent composition of each element, and then using that to work backwards to finding the formula. And this is what CSI techs do every single day, the same exact calculation with this little bitty bit of dimensional analysis in order to identify substances. When they take a swab at a crime scene, they put in what's called a mass spectrometer that burns it, breaks it up into its elements, and separates those elements and weighs how much of each there is in that sample, gets the percent composition information for them, and then they work backwards to identifying what the formula is, exactly like what we're doing right here. So it is a five-step process, so make sure you got enough space in those steps. Uh, to write all of these down. But the first step is to find the grams of each element. Now, in most of our problems, that's going to be given, but there's a chance that they might give you a percent. Like it's saying it's 63% carbon or something like that. All you got to do is replace the percent sign with grams. What we're doing is assuming that there's 100 grams of that substance, so 60% of 100 is 60 grams. So, um, don't worry about it too much, just change any percents you get to grams. Then those grams aren't going to be sticking around for long. We're going to convert those grams to moles using dimensional analysis. And it's really important when we do this that we don't round it. These aren't going to be our final answers. So don't round it down to the whole number or even like one or two decimal places. Keep as many sig figs as possible. For just kind of a Reference, I generally like to keep at least five sig figs, if not six to ten. So, uh, just as a reminder, because we're going from grams to moles, this is going to be the general setup that we use each time. Uh, remember that your molar mass from the periodic table is going to go down here, and that always has one mole on the opposite side. So, whatever grams you're given, or percents you're given in the problem are going to be your given, and then it's a quick little one-step conversion. And we're going to do this for each of our elements that we're given. And then once we have these mole numbers, we're going to divide all of the mole numbers by whichever one is the smallest. Now, this is going to take all of those numbers and make them kind of a ratio of one another. But the smallest one is divided by itself. And any number divided by itself is 1. So that's going to turn the smallest number into 1. And that's important because these are going to end up being our subscripts eventually. So we don't want any numbers smaller than one. Now, these, like I said, should be our subscripts. So they should be whole numbers, but they might not be. So here's a rule of thumb for you. If something is something 0.1, like 3.1 or 2.9, you're going to round that to the whole number. So if it ends in a 0.1 or 0.9, round it to the nearest whole number. So 3.1 rounds to 3. 2.9 rounds to 3. If you have something 0.5, then multiply that and all the rest of the numbers by 2. If you think about it, 0.5 is 1 half, 1 over 2. So multiplying by 2 gets rid of that denominator, gets rid of the decimal. 
0.33 and 0.66 are one third and two thirds, so we're gonna be multiplying those by three. 0.25 or 0.75 is a quarter or three quarters, and we're gonna multiply those by four. So this is just the rule of thumb, and it is really important that we do this. Don't just automatically round those numbers. And above all, whatever you do to one of these numbers, you have to do to all of them. So make sure they're whole numbers. Sometimes we're gonna be rounding, sometimes we might have to multiply to get them to a roundable area. But then, once we have these whole numbers, these are the subscripts in our formula. So we'll actually take each of those element symbols and write this number we just came up with down at the bottom as their subscripts. And that's our empirical formula. So, best way to get the hang of this is to do it. So, like you saw before, I'm gonna do these next two problems with you and then you're gonna be in charge of the third one. Okay, so this one says, find the empirical formula of a compound found to contain 53.70 grams of iron and 46.30 grams of sulfur, okay? So first step was find the grams of each element and hey, well, it gave us grams. So we're gonna write them down. I'm actually gonna start a little bit farther back and in a slightly darker color. So. 53.70 grams of iron, so I'm just going to label this as iron over here, and 46.30 grams of sulfur. So, I found the grams, yay! Step two, convert all of those grams to moles using dimensional analysis. So, we're going to use dimensional analysis. Iron's mass on the periodic table is 55.845 grams per mole, sulfur is 32.066 grams per mole. So when I do this division up top, I get 0 0.96159, and this one is 1 1.443897. So those are my two numbers. Now, step three, divide all of the numbers by whichever is the smallest. So my smallest one is this, so I'm gonna divide it by itself, which of course gives me one, and this gets divided by that same number, 0.96159, and that gives me 1.5. So this now says, step four, make sure all of the numbers are whole numbers. Well, they're not. And 0.5 is not one that I'm gonna be rounding either, 0.5, my rule was multiply by 2, and I'm going to be doing that to both of these numbers to keep that ratio the same. So 1 times 2 is 2, 1.5 times 2 is 3. So these are my subscripts, and so my formula is going to be Fe2s3. This is my final answer. That is the empirical formula for this compound otherwise known as iron 3 sulfide. So, not really that bad of a process, but you have to remember every single little step or else you're not gonna get nice whole numbers as subscripts. So, next problem. This one gives us percents, which is the only real difference, and I guess there's three elements there, so we gotta be a little bit more conservative in space, but remember, just change these percents into grams as we write them down here. So sodium has 32.38 grams, and sulfur is 22.65, and oxygen is 44.99. So I found grams of each of my substances. Now we're gonna convert them to moles using the molar mass. Sulfur again, and oxygen. So once I'm done with this, trying to make this a little bit neater, and I'm gonna change colors just because I'm gonna have to write things so close together. This is getting me, my sodium is 1.40843. Sulfur comes out to be 0 0.706356 and 
one, two, zero, five. So now I've got these numbers in moles. Now step three, darn it, let's try and get that back. Ooh, thank goodness. Step three is gonna be to divide all of these by whichever is the smallest, and that would be this one. So I'm gonna divide all of these numbers, three, five, six, by this, six, three, five, six. And I already know that this middle one that we've already seen number divided by itself is one. This top one turns out to be 1.99, and this bottom one turns out to be 3.9. So those top and bottom ones aren't quite whole numbers, but since they are 0.9 something, then they are close enough to round. So this is gonna be two, and this is gonna be a four. So those are my final numbers, but the last step is to put them into a formula. I don't have space kind of down bottom, so I'm gonna write this up at the top of the screen. Our final answer, the empirical formula for this, is Na2S, one, O, oh, four. And we just don't write the ones. So here we go, Na2SO4, otherwise known as sodium sulfate. Most of the time when you get these formulas, they sh should mostly look reasonable. Although I say that now, the next one, when you're doing it on your own, you're going to look at it and be like, what, really? So remember, this third one is for you to do on your own. You will have to multiply by something, and it's going to come out to be C something, H something, O something. Um, so take it carefully. Once you get those numbers out of, uh, after you've divided by whichever is the smallest, look at them carefully in order to see what you should multiply by. But then make sure they're just whole numbers as subscripts. So you got this. Finish it up if you want to get your stamp.